Well, I happen to notice when I'm working with women that there's a big difference when they do um, come reactively, meaning something has happened and they're maybe in kind of a crisis mode or definitely hugely triggered and they've been upset for quite a few days and so they finally make an appointment and come in versus being uh, proactive, which means they're regularly scheduled for appointments. Because when you're regularly scheduled, I find that they tend to watch their lives more carefully and they're dealing with things when they're less of an emergency so that hopefully um, their whole life becomes more proactive and they're working at things on a regular basis. So instead of having fire drills all the time, as I said, putting out fires, we're now working more, um, we're, we're working more proactively at growing ourselves and knowing ourselves. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. I'm Randy Everett, the co-host. We're here with our host, Dr. Greg Miller. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing well. Greg, we reached into our very <laughs> talented team of experts here at Faithful and True. We have Elizabeth Hardesty Hello. and our director, Debbie Laser, mm -hmm. with us today. Hello, Hi. ladies. Hi, good to Hi be there. here with you all. Well, we're excited about this show today because we have the opportunity to have both Deb and Elizabeth here, and we're going to be talking about reactive and proactive therapy. Right, and kind of using an imagery, it's the, the difference between going to the doctor when you're sick and going to the doctor when you are doing well care. And we think of that physically, but one of the things that we know of um, emotionally, we benefit from the same approach, that there are certain times when something comes up, a crisis or an issue, and we're maybe in despair or having a strong reaction, and we go to our therapist to process that, but there's also this idea of regularly checking in just to see what else might be going on that we need to be attuned to. And so we're going to just be talking about how, how we navigate those, what it looks like, um, and what would be a good response of rhythm for therapy itself. Mm -hmm. So what, what caused you to think about this idea as a topic, Deb? You're the one that brought it did up. Did I bring this up? You did bring it up. <laughs> Well, I happen to notice when I'm working with women that there's a big difference when they do um, come reactively, meaning something has happened and they're maybe in kind of a crisis mode or definitely hugely triggered and they've been upset for quite a few days and so they finally make an appointment and come in versus being uh, proactive, which means they're regularly scheduled for appointments, whatever regular is to them. It could be once a week, it could be once a month or something in between there. Because when you're regularly scheduled, I find that they tend to watch their lives more carefully and they're dealing with things when they're less of an emergency so that hopefully um, their whole life becomes more proactive and they're working at things on a regular basis to know themselves better, to know what they want to change and how to do that and to practice doing some of those things. So instead of having fire drills all the time, as I said, putting out fires, we're now working more, um, we're, we're working more proactively at growing ourselves and knowing ourselves. And I would say there's just a practical benefit. Mm -hmm. I know that here at Faithful and True, our schedules are really full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody's not on the schedule, even if we've seen them, you know, previously, it may be a while before they, they're able to come in unless there's a cancellation or something like that. So there is this benefit just acknowledging that this is a need that I have and I want to have a rhythm that is healthy so that I'm not waiting for a crisis. And a lot of times what happens is I already have something scheduled when there is a crisis. And so I can bring that in. Mm -hmm. What, what do you see as kind of the, the benefit of being more proactive in doing the therapy, Elizabeth? Yeah, I think along the same lines, it just, it, it gives you, you already have that kind of built in. There is that opportunity. And I always tell my clients, the session will not be wasted. You mm -hmm. know, if it's on the calendar, like there will be something, there's, there's something to talk through, but you're not waiting for that fire drill or that huge crisis mm -hmm. that you have to put out. And so I think it's just helpful to know like, okay, that's, that's on the calendar that's coming up. So I can be more mindful even as I move towards that appointment, 
what are the things I want to talk about? What are the things that I want to process? What would what are some things that are going on for me? Mm-hmm. And you're not having to um, to wait six months in order to do that. Mm-hmm. I think one of the benefits is we do believe that self awareness is foundational for spiritual and emotional health, and having that appointment coming up encourages me to do some self reflection and to think about what I might want to process and. Kind of like what you've said, Elizabeth, there are times when a guy will come to the appointment and say, I don't know what to talk about today. And it's like five minutes we're in it and he's very aware. And at the end of that, he may even say, I never thought that that would be something that would be helpful. But many times we know intuitively what needs to be processed, even though cognitively or consciously we may not have named it yet. Mm -hmm. So I think there is this benefit of of being self-aware of what might I need to talk about or what is something. And it doesn't have to be, obviously, if there's a crisis, we know that would be helpful. What what are some of maybe the more subtle things that if I have regular appointments that you, you discover that starts to come up rather than this big crisis? Well, I think there, you know, all of life is a lot of subtle experiences, really. (laughs) And, you know, just that idea of talking about self-reflection. I I mean, before I got into a recovery program where I was in counseling, I wouldn't have even know what in the world you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I know who I am. I know what I look like. I look in the (laughs) mirror. What else do I need to reflect about? (laughs) Um, But truly, there is so much in terms of knowing who we are and why we think the way we do, why we're feeling like we are today, how I've just responded to a situation. Do I like how I've done that? Does it represent the person I want to be? Or have I now started to feel guilty about the way I responded? I mean, there are so many layers to knowing who we are, and that really becomes our self-reflection and our work towards becoming the person that God calls us to be or our best version of ourself, I hear sometimes. And that is why really this whole journey is such a spiritual journey, to be honest, because the more we know that, the more we can work on changing the things that we don't like about ourselves or other people are complaining about in terms of who we are. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think we become a more joyful, peaceful, kind, loving person. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the joke. We go to therapy. Am I nice? (laughs) Someone asked me that recently. I was asked that today. Are you nice? It's kind of the joke. Um, We go to therapy because of those people in our life who don't. (laughs) And so there's always something that we may be getting triggered about. And I know that, you know, one of the the things that I will bring to my therapist is I will have a question, why was my reaction so strong to that? Mm -hmm. You know, I I had this experience. I'm aware that my reaction was disproportionate. And it's helpful to have that place, you know, to process it, to dig a little bit deeper. And if the idea is to be invited to go deeper in our story, we're going to need some encouragement. We're going to need some direction. We may need some challenge. Because typically in our story, there is something that we are resistant to that we'll, you know, we'll push against. And so I, I do see that regular engagement invites me to go deeper into my story, into those spaces that may be on my own, or even with friends I might avoid. I was going to say, I think it's just the, the such a gift of having an environment with a therapist that where you've built that sense of safety, where you've mm-hmm. built that sense of connection. And where else do we have that opportunity where there's someone who wants to sit with us and they are, they're curious, mm-hmm. they ask mm-hmm. good questions. They, they help us ask ourselves good questions. Um, it's just such a place to, to be able to grow in that self-awareness and self-discovery. Yeah. You know, I, there's this kind of message out there of why do I need a therapist? I have good friends. And I think we need both. I, need, I think we do need good friends that we can engage and know us and maybe have a history with us. But there is this beautiful relationship where there is someone who, because we have been seeing them for a while, we have shared a lot of our story with them. They know our history because we've shared it versus have experienced with us. And they have a healthy detachment. Mm-hmm. They're not in it. They can see things that we can't see And we are giving them permission to come into our life and speak into our life. And I do think that there's this gift in that, that our friends are wonderful and they're not able to do that in the same way as a skilled therapist. Well, and I think that's why 
people that do what we do as a career have also been trained in various ways. Mm -hmm. And training teaches us to know what to look for and how to ask mm -hmm. those curious questions and to dig deeper. I mean, if everyone could do that, we wouldn't need this profession. And so uh, just like if everyone could do some minor surgery on each other because mm -hmm. we're friends and we like you, we want you to feel well, we wouldn't need our surgeons, mm -hmm. but they have to be trained and ready to go and do some of those things that we can't do for ourselves. So um, I think it is really important to at least experience the difference. You may decide you have someone that isn't all that helpful or it doesn't feel right, in which case you could change, or you could decide, you know, right now it's not what's working for you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a good point. I, th I think um, we do hear of those situations where someone met with a therapist, they didn't have a good experience for whatever reason, and then there can be this tendency to dismiss therapy as a whole. So what would be the encouragement? Let's say that someone said, well, I tried it. It didn't work for me. Um, what might be some of the ways to identify if it is a good fit? Um, how to identify if it is helpful, if it is moving you forward, if you're, if you're really wanting to try to do something on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And maybe another question is, and when do you know maybe it's time to end that relationship and begin to engage somebody else? Mm -hmm. You want to go first? Sure. Well, I always say that, uh, and one of the things I love helping women work with is learning to trust themselves. And that's going to involve uh, listening to and identifying what you're feeling, first of all, and your experience when you are with someone. And when you're there, do you feel safe? Do you feel like you can talk? Or do you feel like you've been judged? Or are they giving you too much advice and they're doing all the talking and really was your counseling session? When you leave, do you feel better than when you started? And I would say in general, that should be the case uh, each and every time. I, you know, maybe there's an occasional time when that doesn't happen and you're pressed to talk about things that are too hard or whatever. Um, we all have off days, but generally speaking, I think someone should feel better when they leave their counseling session than when they came in the door. <laughs> And so I really trust people. I don't think they need to wait six weeks to decide that. Um, maybe give it a second time in case the first didn't. Maybe not. They mm -hmm. might be that confident about trusting themselves that they will make that decision right away. Mm -hmm. I also like the idea of is the experience bringing clarity and in some way freedom? Because mm -hmm. like you said, sometimes you leave a counseling session and because of where it went and what you talked about, you don't leave feeling better. You leave feeling profoundly sad or grieving or confused. Or, or confused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is there a pattern of clarity about something or a little bit more free about something in my life so that mm -hmm. there's, there's an invitation to read? There's a part of me. There's a prompting of, I do want to do this again. I may, I may be resistant, but there was something here for me. There's a benefit. Yeah, yeah. that I want to explore. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you said already, Greg, too, um, if if by some chance you do leave that and you realize this is not, this does not feel like a safe space or I do not feel um, uh, like that lifting has happened or that freedom has happened, not giving up. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's something that you know would benefit you, something that you know that you're needing, continuing to look for that because it may take a little bit of shopping around to uh, to find mm -hmm. to find the person that you're like, this, this is. And then just knowing, I've had women say that, like, oh, this feels different. Mm -hmm. You know, this feels like a place that I was looking for. And so just learning to really listen to your gut and trust yourself in mm -hmm. that. And be okay with the fact that you don't know. I mean, Part of it is someone will say, well, what are you looking for? And you're going, well, I don't know. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm looking for. Um, but if you can have conversations with people and get a little bit of clarity um, so that you can at least narrow the field and then trust your, your gut. Was this a good experience? Did I feel like something helpful was going on? I always like to say there's a sense of peace or relief um, when you leave, and it may not be that everything is all settled and usually is not. There's a lot more to talk about. But are you in a different place in terms of peace, or is your peace really disturbed? Um, because I think many times when your peace is disturbed, it's still speaking to a lot of things not being safe enough for you mm -hmm. in there. And that's what I really like people to think about. And I, I believe it's true. There's no one person who can be right for everybody. 
And so for them to say, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. I didn't get along with them, but everybody talks about how great they are. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just different and they have different needs in there. Mm -hmm. So we need to know that we we can shop until we find the right person, just like teachers are different. Mm -hmm. Some teachers really speak to us well and some are annoying and we don't like their methods and we need somebody different. So mm -hmm. it's very similar in this career as well. Right. And I do know that there are times when something does come up and I do need to engage. Maybe I don't see my therapist except once a month or every six weeks. And so there are those moments of that something happened, I'm reacting to this, I know that I need some help, um, and so I can reach out to the therapist. What I would say about that is that's happened to me where someone has reached out to me and said, I'm in this crisis, can I get on your calendar? And the nature of my calendar is sometimes I can say yes and sometimes I say no. But I also want the person to understand, even if they're unable to see me immediately, there are still resources that they have. You know, are there some people that you can process this with? Can you reach out to some people in your community? Kind of are there some options that you have as we're waiting for our next appointment? Because that may be what is possible. Mm -hmm. Can I back this talk up even just for a second? Yeah. So I think I think one thing that I've appreciated of even my clients is um, their empowerment to ask the question and, and um, advocate for themselves by asking, what is a good cadence? Mm -hmm. You know, like how often, how often should I be on your calendar? Because I, I think even for myself coming into therapy, I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going, getting a gym membership, it's like, okay, once every six weeks may not do a whole lot for your mm -hmm. physical health. Right. Um, but even knowing like for, for therapy, like what even is a cadence that is 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 good is going to be beneficial is that once a week is that once a month is that once every six weeks so i think that can be a helpful thing here too is and really encouraging people to advocate for themselves and ask those questions yeah mm -hmm. and know that it can change i know that mm -hmm. early in my recovery it was once a week because mm -hmm. there is so much chaos and destruction that i needed this stable stabilizing factor in my life and um, one of the great things about group is it does meet consistently and so I could look towards that and also create, okay, eventually I didn't need to do every week, maybe it was once a month, mm -hmm. and create that rhythm. So whatever you start with may not be what you end up with, and more than likely it's not. Mm -hmm. But trust yourself. And I've also had that experience where something shifted in me and I had gone to, you know, once every six weeks or once every two months or as needed kind of basis, and then something else came up and I found myself going back on a regular basis. Yeah. We talk a lot about trusting yourself, and that, that's a, a new idea for a lot of people about what does that mean. Um, but I think that is that internal spiritual place where when we slow down life enough to listen to our emotions and listen to the thoughts that are flying through our heads and um, put them together to really know wh when do I feel peace and joy in what's going on. And it doesn't mean everything in life is joyful. It just means that I'm making progress. I feel like I'm moving in a direction that, that gives me good feelings about the person that I am. And so learning to do that instead of other people telling you what you should be doing is also part of mm -hmm. self-reflection mm -hmm. and learning and growing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, at least we do that a lot for women, don't mm -hmm. we? Yeah. Assuming you do for men yeah. as well. When I yeah. also, you know, you alluded to this, Elizabeth, but I do think it's helpful when I have clarity, what I want to work on, what what part of me isn't helping me to be the person that God created me to be. And um, the therapy group that I went to for years, part of the our responsibility was show up knowing what we wanted to talk about or work on. And that that just ingrained in me, whether it's group or an appointment, I can be more proactive. I can find agency to say, hey, this is what I would like to talk about. I didn't show up in this situation, or I did have this overreaction, or I'm still struggling to do this. And so in, in the early days, it seemed to be a lot about the addiction and the chaos that it created. But I think what many people experience is time progresses once either the husband or the wife has confidence that the addiction is being addressed, then there's this additional space to go after those other things that keep me from being the person that God created me to be. One of the things that I know I, I've used to try to help women start to think about what do I want to bring to counseling is having a check-in process with my clients. Mm -hmm. And I still do that, especially with new ones. 
and it helps them to think about various things in their week. And so as they do that, they get better and better at just knowing that and bringing those things up without having to do a check-in. Um, but I really like that process because it's true. A lot of times we're not sure what we're supposed to be talking about in counseling. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know if it's an appropriate topic or not. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, until you gain confidence that anything is okay to talk right. about in here and that also anything will be heard and not judged and and not given advice and all of that, will you know that it really can be anything you want to bring there? Yeah. Well, and even when a client will say, is it okay if I talk about this? <laughs> you know, they're mm -hmm. kind of pushing the boundaries. And that's an exciting place to be where they're exploring to see what are the things that we can really talk about mm -hmm. that. I know that Beth talked about the other day where someone hesitantly asked, can we talk about this? And and that that's showing that that person is expanding in their understanding of the role that the therapy can have mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting after Mark passed away and I came back after a number of months, um, I found that a lot of my clients wanted to talk about death and dying. Mm -hmm. And then they would usually start by saying, are you okay if we talk about that? Because I don't want to trigger you. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it to be a really a really engaging topic for all of us to talk about because it was very fresh for me. And because I had taken time and had my own support around that, it wasn't triggering to me to talk about that or it didn't put me in a worse place, which I think is always people's fear that if certain topics come up, they'll trigger you as a therapist or, you know, put you in a bad place. But it was a great example of how for months, really, I talked about that with many, many mm -hmm. of my clients. It also shows, I think, too, mm -hmm. Debbie, there, the, the amount of safety mm -hmm. that those clients felt with you. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think to risk asking that question mm -hmm. of, is it okay? Yeah. Is this an okay topic? Is it okay if I go there? Yeah. To even ask that question, I think, says a lot mm -hmm. about what they're feeling in terms of that mm -hmm. safety and that right. relationship. And for a lot of people, it's pushing against their shame. Yeah. You know, there are certain topics that they've been told you're not supposed to talk about, or there's this sense of shame about that this aspect in their life. And so it really takes a lot of courage to bring this topic and say, hey, can we talk about this? Is that this? too much for you? Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. it, it's almost like it's too much for me. <laughs> I'm checking out. Is it too much for <laughs> you? And mm -hmm. to know that there's somebody that, no, this isn't too much mm -hmm. for me. I can be with you in this. You know, one, one of the things I, I see and I think can be a pattern is for some people, what happens is things start going better, you know, and, and I do feel strong in my recovery and sobriety. I do feel like, you know, I'm out of that chaos. And then there's a temptation to start backing away from some of the things that have been helpful. And I think I want to encourage people, you don't stop doing the things that have supported you on your emotional journey just because things are going well. You, you may lessen them some, but you also want to, if it's working, then you want to continue to do that support and it's kind of like the person who stops talk, um, stops taking the antibiotic once they start to feel well and they don't have the symptoms anymore. Sometimes we can stop the things that are working that are supporting us. And so one of the things I would encourage when someone's thinking about stopping therapy is to really have that conversation with their therapist and, and not to get permission, is it okay if I stop coming, but more for there to be clarity about what in me is shifting why am I wanting to have this conversation? Um, and, and what are some of the things I could be looking for? Because what's true in my own journey, I'm not working with the therapist now that I started with. That in the 18 years of my recovery, I've had season of different therapists, depending on what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So we do mm -hmm. come to the end of a relationship with a therapist. That doesn't mean we come to the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it may be too that they're being proactive about putting other things in their life, like uh, groups. They may have a recovery group at their church, or they may have decided to work on that spiritual part of their life with a spiritual director or, or some other way. Or they may have several friends who have been through this, and they truly are 
uh, together as a group, able to do a lot of things for each other. Mm -hmm. So I think there can be replacements for professional therapy as you go along, as as I said in my book, take the show on the road Mm -hmm. and find other ways to get some of those needs met that don't always have to pay somebody for. And that can be lovely, too, because we don't all want to pay for counseling the rest of our life sometimes. Absolutely. And it's it's okay to be able to say to the therapist, I feel like I'm at a good place. And one of the things that um, I ended my relationship with uh, many, many men over the years. And there's typically this nod to, and if I need to come back or if something comes up, can I come back? And the answer is absolutely. You know, Mm -hmm. if you do get into that crisis where something comes up or it doesn't even have to be a crisis, it can simply be an awareness that, wow, my anxiety is still operating or I still really haven't found my voice in my relationships. But when you become aware of, oh, this part of my life really isn't working, this can be something I can bring into the conversation with a therapist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, back to like, think, listening to yourself, just listening for those little nudges that maybe tell you like, okay, I'm feeling a shift. I'm feeling maybe it is time to build something else in or shift in some way. And, And there again, having community. Having some safe people, having some um, some people that you trust that you can sound that off of. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm wondering about. I'm curious about, um, and and certainly following those nudges, but also getting some feedback. You know, mm-hmm. is is this wise? And what what does what does wise look like to really um, continue in this journey well? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, if you've been to our workshops, you know that one of the things that we talk about is this idea of the recovery team, and so therapy counseling is one of the things on the team. But as Deb has indicated, we want a variety of different things on the team or on the bus supporting us on our journey. And things may take priority over time as we are in different seasons. But I often say I've never seen someone be successful with only one resource. And so one of the things that may be true for some of you is the counselor is the only resource that you have. And so the invitation would be to move beyond that into these groups, into community, into deeper connections of Um, in your spiritual relationships or faith, whatever that might look like, and allow the counselor now to be one of the things supporting you, but not the only thing supporting you. Well, have any of you got a closing statement that you'd like to make as our time has come to an end here to wrap things up? Well, I'm always about the invitation. So I think the invitation in this is to really be aware of what your needs are and um, ask for those and get clarity if you need to with the therapist that you're working with. But for those of you that have been hesitant to find that person, it is a risk. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge. You do have to do research, but there's, you are worth it. You are worth whatever it takes to find that good match. Mm May and, I add another statement? Well, that's a <laughs> double statement. But I'm looking at the clock, but I don't know. That'll cost you extra because Erin didn't start the, time, the timer on time. Go ahead. Well, I like to think of um, putting a counselor or therapist in your life just as you would put a personal trainer in your life because you wanted to physically be fit. I, I think anymore we could think of these folks as being our personal trainers for our emotional well-being. And if there's sadness or anger or out of control behaviors, you don't like yourself as much as you would like to, you have issues with relationships, consider it a personal trainer to um, hire someone to walk alongside with you because it can make such a difference in your joy and peace in life. Well, that was worth putting in there. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank you all for watching our podcast today. We'd like to thank Debbie and Elizabeth for their participation. And Greg, as always, what do you tell me? Brilliant. That's right. That's that's, that's the word we're going to use today. Uh, We'd like to invite you to visit our website, faithfulandtrue.com, where you'll find over 400 podcasts uh, along the lines of today's uh, presentation. And we also have the information and online registration for our Men's Journey Workshop, our Women's Journey Workshop, and information about giving us a call about either one of our two new Couples Journey Workshops. So until we meet you again next time, we'd like to thank you. We'd like to hope that this week is a week that's filled with many blessings and with great vision.